All right. And what's all this about? G'day, I'm Andrew Mercado, and 30 years ago, The Young Doctors quietly premiered on Australian television in November 1976. Channel 9 were trying it out in the non-ratings period with the Sullivans, the plan being that they would only keep one of the shows on air. When the summer was finished, the decision was made and the naughty nurses weren't on the schedule. However, at the wrap party, cast and crew got the news that last minute research had shown that both shows could be a goer. So the wake turned into a wild celebration and the young doctors stayed on air for another six years. To find out what happened next, let's head inside this studio as we reunite with some of the stars of The Young Doctors. Before I did Doctors, I was in Melbourne and I was doing a show called Bluey and I was John Dietrich's model girlfriend and he was an ex-model before he became a policeman. I think that's what he was in the show. And I was also Lucky's, that's Bluey's, um, prostitute lover. And there, I was always standing on the corner smoking cigarettes in my high heels with a ton of makeup and I couldn't smoke cigarettes. And I don't know why they ever cast me as a prostitute. Do you think I look? I don't think I did. Anyway, and actually it was John Dietrich who helped me smuggle my pussycat panda moon on the in my model bag onto the train so that I could go up to Sydney on the train with Panda um, to do doctors. I didn't want to put Panda on a plane because Panda was on heat and um, she was very, you know, beautiful little timid little pussycat and I thought if she goes on a plane it'll probably kill her so a vet gave me some tablets to give Panda to knock Panda out. So John just picked me up at my motel, put panda in in my bag ran into the car and and panda kept moving so I kept talking a lot you know talking movement and John was looking at me he always thought I was a bit strange I think and um, anyway the last thing I remember was John was sort of on the station going like this and my bag was moving and I was on the train and panda the the tablets didn't work panda's eyes were rolled back and she was crying howling yowling all night so I had to put my hair dryer on in my little compartment in the train and the conductor kept knocking on the door saying um, are you all right? You know, do you want tea in the morning, or can I help you put the bed down? I kept saying no, no, no. I had to keep talking like I'm talking now to go over Panda's scream. And the next morning, when we were at sta the station, I opened the door with Panda, stuffed Panda in my model bag, and the conductor was just outside the door looking. And I ran down the corridor, looked around, and the conductor was looking at me, thinking, "Anyway, Panda was all right, you know." That was some time ago. I know. I'd been um, working on television features at that stage uh, when I was asked to, um, oh, well, they wanted to talk to me about the young doctors. And um, I, I wasn't all that mad about the idea at first, but then I thought as an actor, and I always thought as an actor I'd make a damn good drummer, um, but uh, as an actor I could do with a bit more work. And um, the uh, television serial Young Doctors offered the opportunity for repertory style um, training and practice of learning those lines and spitting them out day after day and reading the scripts that are going to be, we're working on next week at the same time as learning the lines for tomorrow and on it went, on it went. And, but that, uh, uh, I thought it'd be great for an actor doing all that work. And um, the nature of the show, of course, uh, was the production schedule was gruelling. 5 a.m. starts in makeup uh, five days a week, and um, and we would go through to sometimes eight and nine o'clock at night um, to get the desired amount of minutes in the can, so that indeed the program could keep up with its uh, to-air schedules, I guess. So the, it was high-pressure television, um, and of course a lot of people called it sausage factory television. Well, that's a joke. 
I'd done a couple of films uh, before Young Doctors. I did Stone, which became a bit of an icon in its later life, uh, and a film for, of the number 96 series. In the summer break, they made a, a really awful film, uh, which nearly wrecked my career before it began. Uh, it was actually one of the first opportunities, and I think almost the only opportunity I had in my, my career to play a baddie, so that was fun. And I did a, a stint in a series called Glenview High. I have never felt so humiliated in my entire life. I think I must have done an audition, but it was such a long time ago that it's all a bit of a blur. Uh, I'm sure I did, uh, and I, I guess I must have fitted into the pink uniform because I got the role. So tell me about your character, and can you remember everybody you had affairs with? Ta Tanya, I kept calling her Tanya or Tanya and I kept changing, so I think it was Tanya. Tanya Living Livingston had so many boyfriends and she was engaged, I, I think probably about three or four times she had engagements and she was engaged to doctors and racing car drivers and all sorts of interesting people, married once and then she was going to marry Peter, Dr Holland at the end of the show. So she did very well for herself. Aren't you being a bit dramatic? Well, of course, um, the affair or the uh, romance uh, that led up to the uh, marriage circumstance with Rebecca Gilling's character, uh, that was one. And of course, it was a fabulous, a lot of fun, you know, and, uh, and what guy wouldn't, wouldn't want to be uh, cuddling and kissing uh, the beautiful Rebecca at the time. And uh, I think a lot of fellows were quite jealous of me. And then, of course, the boss's wife was another um, relationship that my character enjoyed in the show, uh, Joy Chambers, and, uh, or Mrs Grundy. And um, Joy and I became very good friends, and I must say uh, she was a, a light for me at the time. Uh, it, was, it was really um, fabulous. We became very, very good friends, and, and I miss her. I miss her to this day. I don't see much of her anymore. I, I believe she's somewhere in Bermuda or somewhere like that with uh, Reg and uh, I wish them both well, of course. Too numerous to mention <laughs> the men she had love affairs with. Uh, I remember particularly, of course, Dr Ben Fielding, my good friend Eric Oldfield, and Alan Dale, who was, um, who, with whom I never got to consummate, uh, which was something of a relief, I must say, because <laughs> we, were, we were definitely um, not made for one another. <laughs> You take the cake, Phil. I don't give a damn what you think about me, Forrest. If you do anything to hurt Liz, I'll make sure that your life isn't worth living. The file you were looking for. Liz was a very efficient nurse, and in fact, I think so efficient that uh, the, the producers decided after I'd been working as Nurse Liz Kennedy for about a year, that actually my character was coming across as a little too intelligent to be a nurse, so they turned me into a psychologist overnight. I had this psychology degree in my back pocket that I hadn't really revealed to anybody, so I, I left as Nurse Liz Kennedy one day and came back as psychologist Liz Kennedy the following week. Um, which was a bit odd, and, and uh, it wouldn't be allowed today, of course, because in those days nurses probably didn't have uh, the reputation that they do now. I mean, now it's a, it's a highly qualified profession. Um, then I think it was, it was um, not, not as highly thought of. Oh, well, you can't win them all. <laughs> was the Albert Memorial a hospital you would have liked to have been taken to when you were sick? They didn't seem real big on medical procedures to me. Absolutely not, absolutely. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, um, one of the sisters uh, was, a, was a real sister in the show. Get her name. Anyway, she was in the show and she was a real sister. And she taught us how to put needles in, you know, like put needles into people. So we had to put needles into oranges so that we could learn. And I, I don't like needles, Andrew at all. So I used to have the orange, you know, when we were practicing and I used to sort of just put it anywhere and she'd say, Judy, you're not even putting it in the orange. You've got to look and see what you're doing. So no, I would not like to be sick in the Albert Memorial. Everybody would have died. We didn't have many patients anyway. It was all love affairs. Excuse me, I think I'm wanted in casualty. Well, look, you know, I really can't remember what came first at this stage, whether or not Young Doctors did or the series Chopper Squad, which I believe they did see around the world. I got mailed to testify to that. But um, the Chopper Squad series, um, we were playing paramedics. 
and the uh, logistics and safety men and the medical people on board the show, they insisted that things had to be true to form, you know, you, you couldn't be giving any form of resuscitation or carrying out any procedures that weren't, you know, um, absolutely appropriate at the time. But in the young doctors, and it was quite different, you know, um, I, I, I don't think many would have survived in that hospital <laughs> quite Honestly, I think they, if they were crook, they were going to stay that way. <laughs> there was a lot of doe eyes over the, over the um, ailing patients, weren't there? And um, we were sort of given uh, vague instructions on how to handle all the equipment, but uh, I suspect anybody, uh, anybody with a professional eye cast over it would cringe horribly. All right, Ben. All right. I just thought... Yeah. You just thought I'd make it easier for you. Well, I won't. What do you remember about that studio? It was kind of <gasps> nasty, wasn't do it? Do you know that studio in Blues Point Road was really an old sausage factory? That's what I was told. And it was freezing in winter, absolutely freezing. We had to wear dressing gowns over our uniforms before we were about to shoot, and then just throw the dressing gown on the floor. And also in summer, I used to get the hair dried just to try and dry my uniform because, you know, we were sewn into the uniforms, they were so tight you couldn't sit down, but it was, you know, it was so hot, it was, it was boiling. I mean, equity would not allow it nowadays. You could never slam a door because the wall would, whole wall would shake, you know, so even when you were angry you had to go, <sighs> close the door quietly. <laughs> <laughs> which did sort of take uh, something from the drama of the moment. Oh, um, paintings falling off the wall occasionally, you know, fireplaces that were supposed to be stone, you know, you notice them shake. It was a big drafty barn under a flight path uh, just off a major highway, so it was incredibly noisy and, and we lost a lot of time waiting for noises to stop. Um, but it was a... It, see, I was very young and I didn't really have much to compare it with. Um, stone was made on a shoestring as well and the conditions on that were, were, um, were, were something that the union wouldn't have approved of had they known. Um, so it just was, seemed par for the course for me that you, you, um, you, know, you worked long hours in, in fairly adverse conditions. Um, I do remember that, that uh, we, we were always running short of time. I think we shot five episodes in three days or something of that order. And so if you managed to get the words out without stumbling too badly, it was considered a take and we moved on. And it was considered very bad form to ask for another take or to deliberately stop because you didn't like your performance. I can remember going into the sets and um, they, the lighting wouldn't change almost from one day to the next. And having worked in film and um, worked with wonderful cameramen as you do, who, whose pride is their lighting. It must have been quite soul destroying for those behind cameras to have to look at the actors with lighting that obviously didn't work. And, and because of the schedule, quite often they would accept a scene where say one actor would have cast a shadow across the face of the other actor. And, uh, but they'd accept that take because they didn't have time to shoot it again. Uh, but it was a great classroom for that too because you just had to save yourself. If you could see an actor's head getting between you and the light, we'll say, you would actually move over a little <laughs> to save yourself. But that's all you had, you had to save yourself. And it was great training, it was great training. The Young Doctors was also renowned for having wild parties, is that true? We used to do that in the canteen. I can remember, you know, we would be dancing on the tables and things like that. And I didn't drink in those days, so everyone used to get really wound up and I'd just get wound up on happiness. So, you know, I was up there with all the rest, but yeah, they were pretty wild. They were really fun, really fun parties. Oh yes, but I'm a good boy. I wouldn't have gone to those. <laughs> no, of course, yeah. I think it had to do with um, the necessary unwinding that one had to find at the end of a big day. And remembering that what the shooting schedules were like, uh, there were a lot of dialogue. It was, you know, may I say, overwritten as far as words went. And um, yeah, so at the end of the day, I think everyone was groping for some sort of liquid refreshment to not only cool down, but uh, certainly slow the mind down a bit, steady down. But yeah, wild parties. But uh, if I said I don't really remember them, is that a bad sign? <laughs> Maybe they were that good, I don't remember them. <laughs> we had a lot of parties uh, as we were filming. I mean, because it was a fairly big cast, 
um, you often uh, were called and did one or two scenes and one scene at the beginning of the day and another scene at the end of the day so there'd be a hell of a lot of hanging around and there'd always be a little corner that you could go to to have a bit of fun. I remember we used to have a bit of fun with the laughing gas between takes. Um, there was a little group of, of uh, naughty rebels of which I was one, um, surprise, surprise. Uh, that um, had a bit of a go with the laughing gas, but yeah, it it was it was it was all good fun for us. Um, we didn't take it too seriously. Oh, so. I don't think my nerves will stand it. The, the the bit of mail that sticks out most in my mind was was uh, a letter I got when I did the number ninety six feature film, where I was accused of of corrupting the youth of the nation uh, because it was a bit risque for the time, uh, but. Young Doctors was, a, I, I, was, uh, I was a fairly sort of, I mean, even though, as you say, I had lots of relationships with lots of blokes, um, it, you did that in the 70s, so it didn't really mm -hmm. um, attract all that much attention. But, but uh, it, I think it was mostly the blokes who got all the fan mail on, on Young Doctors because it was a predominantly female audience. One of the things you did in the, the 70s was you didn't just do one, but you did two Cleo Centipoles. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, the, um, I think I was second, um, the second body to be exposed in the Clio magazine after Jack Thompson, who's a great mate of mine. Uh, actually, the photographer Peter Corrette shot the shots for me on Jack's farm. And they're the creek shots that were very popular. Yes, oh, I was fun doing that stuff. But of course, it was breaking certain taboos at the time. I mean, it wasn't sort of all that... Um, acceptable really for men to be taking their clothes off and in the magazines though I, I suppose as they might say we didn't really see anything you know <laughs> but uh, oh and, the, and the, uh, a certain a sort of a gay icon I've developed into I noticed too that people uh, dig up my name I can they can go to my name on the internet and up come all these Cleo shots and I just certainly didn't put them in there <laughs> well that's something I suppose it was my first experience of really being in a sort of an ensemble cast. So there was a real, uh, uh, there was a democratic feel, even though there was a certain hierarchy because of, of course, uh, Gwen Plum was the, um, was the, the dowager of the piece. Um, the, among the rest of us, there, there really were no stars. And I remember Alan Dale coming in. Uh, I'd, I'd been in for a, in the cast for about a year, and Alan Dale appeared, and he walked onto the set and said, um, "Who is the star around here? Who is the lead?" And we all said, uh, "We don't have any leads. It's an ensemble piece." And he said, "Oh well, I'm aiming to change all that." Don't you go too far, nurse, or you'll regret it. I still surprisingly get people stopping me in the supermarket saying, "I remember you in the Young Doctors. It was my favourite show." Uh, which is staggering, really, that there are still there are people old enough to remember it. But um, it, it, yeah, it's 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 fabulous that that people are still enjoying it. It was a bit of fun. Um, those ridiculous little pink uniforms with their little white aprons and the little caps. I mean, you know, I can't imagine nurses being put through all that now. But no, it was great fun. Oh, well, the young the young doctors for me was a lot of fun. It was a light-hearted program. We all enjoyed our time there in spite of the, the big shooting schedules. Uh, the producer, Alan Coleman, he was such a joy to be with and, and made the whole project very palatable no matter, uh, no matter how difficult it became at times. And uh, he was a great lifesaver during the project. No, a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And um, as I say, I don't think you would have lived for very long had you had serious problems when you went into the hospital. But uh, nonetheless, it was. It was, look, it was good. Good fun. Well, the Young Doctors came at a time when, when I was living away. I was living in Melbourne and I was really homesick. So I spent six of the most beautiful years in that, in that place and I met you know, all of those people were my friends and I was there five days a week and we'd be doing publicity shots on the weekend anyway. And I thought Young Doctors was a beautiful show. I, th I felt it was innocent and sweet and, and a good show and I think that's why people remember it. You know, it was a, yeah, and they still they still do. They still sort of talk about it, and you know, you, you could not have a sort of show like that nowadays. But I just thought it was a very sweet, innocent, lovely show. You know, I've been through quite a lot, Tanya, but you are the most beautiful bride I've ever seen. Oh. <laughs> and this is the proudest moment of my life. Well, shall we go?